to me, I think this is a design marketing partnership where understanding how these assets would be used helps designers make sure that when they do create great stuff, it's actually given the best opportunity to succeed. What's up, brand new experts, Arek here at Ibeck Design, and my guest today is Jenny Romaniuk. And Jenny is a research professor and associate director international of the Ehrenberg Bass Institute at the University of South Australia. So through her work at the Institute, Jenny has advised many of the world's biggest brands on best practice, long-term brand management, and using evidence-based uh, knowledge. So she's also the author of How Brands Grow and uh, Building Distinctive Assets, uh, brand assets, which is the book right here, and, and this is the book we are going to talk about today. So Jenny is an expert when it comes to branding and specifically uh, things like brand equity, mental availability, uh, brand health metrics, advertising effectiveness, and distinctive assets, of course. So uh, that's why I really wanted to have Jenny on our podcast today to talk about distinctive brand assets. Hello, Jenny. Thanks for joining us. Hello, it's great to be here. Uh, so, in the introduction, you argue that most of the books on brand building tend to just see brand identity uh, as a design exercise, right? With the aesthetics at, at the core of choices, but uh, through your work, you actually teach us on how to make more meaningful decisions. Uh, so, when it comes to things like redesigning the logo, choosing color palette, choosing the right typography, creating a tagline, perhaps using characters, mascots, influencers, spokes, uh, people, and so on, so, so that we can harness the value of, of those different brand assets, right? You make evidence-based informed decisions, uh, how to make those evidence-based based informed decisions so so that we can make less mistakes uh, and we can get better at branding right so uh, when it comes to mistakes for example uh, tropicana or gap uh, these these are kind of uh, and these are the examples that you talk about in your book as well so and i think this is also you know these are big brands so we all know or most of us designers creative people know about th those mistakes so can you just talk to us about uh, a, a little a little bit about benefits of using your scientific approach when building brand assets versus just relying on, on pure aesthetics. Yeah, I mean, part of it is, uh, part of the goal of the book is to shift the conversation away from should we choose red or blue to is colour a useful asset for us to develop and why? Because there are some contexts where colour as a property in the, how our eyes react to colour, how colour helps something get noticed is a really important property. If you go to that stage first of understanding the property of the assets and you can decide what type of asset. So then you can, as a marketer, strategically invest in the right types of assets. And then within that type, there are some styles of assets that are going to help the brand more um, versus help the brand more stand out versus you know make it blend in if it's more common. So that's when the style comes into it in terms of should you choose red or blue? Well, it depends. Do other brands use red or blue? If other brand lots of other brands use red then that's not a smart colour from a distinctive asset perspective. So the design aspect of it then comes into how do you, you made a decision blue is the best colour, how do you bring that to life? And so that means that the, the most value can come out of the aesthetics and the design and the creative side of it because you've made, you've honed down the, the decision to an area where you're giving the brand identity the best opportunities to succeed. So to me, I think this is a design marketing partnership where understanding how these assets would be used helps designers make sure that when they do create great stuff, it's actually given the best opportunity to succeed. So it works on both sides. Because I can imagine as a designer, there's nothing more frustrating than doing really great creative and then it 
failing in the market because proper consideration wasn't given to what that great creative should actually be about. Right. And and, and you give us a lot of examples in the book, um, uh, real case scenarios, so so that we can all, all understand the concepts. But um, OK, so you divided your book basically to like uh, three broad sections, right, which is the strategy, uh, measurement and uh, implementation. Right. So uh, so I just wanted to, the, you know, uh, go over those 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 three uh, talking points. So starting with the strategy. So uh, I wanted to talk a bit ab about um, each of those sections and, and you know, so so first in, in, in the strategy, you talk about how we create memories and associations with the, with the brands we experience, right? And you talk about your story, for example, your, your first Uber ride and how you, you, you uh, created those associations, you know, in, in your memory with the brand, you know, uh, so that way we can anchor those different brand assets with the with the brand name and the next time we see that we kind of like you, you talk about retrieval right we 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 remember those experiences and uh, so can you just uh, talk about that this first section the strategy and perhaps you know give us some examples uh maybe, maybe you can touch on 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 subjects like associative associative network mental and physical availability um yeah, so c can you just uh, talk a bit about that? Now we are going to take a quick break here, but we will be right back. Listen, my mission is to help people build and design iconic brands. So whether you're a business leader who wants to be more intentional with branding and all of its aspects, or you are a creative professional who wants to attract powerful clients and truly be able to help them with branding, then you need to start with a discovery session in order to develop a strategy that will inform all of your creative work. And everything that you need to learn how to do that, you can find in my online courses at ebaydesign.com shop, where I share with you my worksheets, case studies, video tutorials, and other additional resources to help you feel safe and strong about your process. And now let's get back to our interview. Sure, sure. They're big topics, so I'm not sure we've got time to go into them in depth. But, yeah, I mean, so a memory is like a network of associations. This is a common model of memory. It's, you know, it's one of the oldest forms. It goes back to Aristotle was the first person recorded to propose this. Um, but what that means is that things get associated with other stuff. And, and this is important to understand how we form memories because marketing is largely about forming memories, forming the right memories, the most useful memories. Part of those are the brand identity, because that's what you want to trigger the brand. Um, and part of those are other associations that help the brand get bought. Um, and so, you know, if we understand how memories are formed, we're better placed to do it. But yet often brand strategy lacks that grounding in how our memory works. And the other thing to remember is our memory is not like a computer. It's not perfect that we can search and it will come up. It's a, well, if it is a computer, it's a very dodgy one that we wouldn't think because we constantly forget stuff. We constantly fail to retrieve stuff. It's, it's, it's just the function of life. Um, and so part of the job is to keep memories fresh and again, as in, in the marketing field in general, we, we, we forget that. We forget that we don't just tell someone once. We have to remind them even of things they already know because we've got to keep things fresh. So when it comes to brand identity, we first of all have to build it. And to build it, we need the brand name there. And one of the most, the biggest mistakes marketers make and designers, I will say, as part of this is when trying to build assets, Forget that in the initial stages, you have to have the pairing of the asset you want to build and the brand name, because that's what forms the associations in memory. Because anything that gets added to our memory needs something already in our memory to act as the anchor for it. If you've ever sat there and listened to two people speaking a language you don't know, even if someone, even if you listened intently and afterwards someone asked you to repeat that, you wouldn't be able to. Your brain wouldn't be able to remember it because there's no anchor for it. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so, so the brand name's an important anchor. And so we need to do the asset building phase before we move to the um, asset using phase where we can not have the brand name as much and actually use it as a standalone branding device. Now, mental availability is, a, is about the um, propensity of the brand to be thought of in buying situations. Even when we've got all the brands in front of us in a supermarket, we don't pay attention to everything. Uh, you know, we've no interest in that. What happens is we screen in a few and our brains, you know, kind of narrows that down for us. It does it. We don't even notice it happens. Um, and you can check this by going to the supermarket, going to a category you buy from, but maybe not that often, and stopping and looking at everything that's on the shelf. And you realise it's all these things that have happened in that category you didn't even notice. Mm -hmm. Physical availability is about being easy to find and buy. So think about mental availability is getting the brain ready. Physical availability is making it easy for people to act on that. And distinctive asset cuts across both of them because it is important in building mental availability because that's done through all of our marketing activity, our advertising, our social media, anything that goes out there with uh, the brand's name on it, distinctive assets can help enhance the branding and make sure it goes to the right part of people's brains. Distinctive assets help physical availability because then when people are in buying situations, often those are competitive. There's lots of other brands around. You want your brand to stand out from the others and be easy to go, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the one with the pink top, that's the one I want, um, and walk away. So that's where what we call shopping assets really come into their fore, the assets that people use when they're trying to find brands in shopping environments. And we can train people to work out to use the shopping assets we want them to use by putting them in our advertising so that we're priming the brain already so that when people go into buying situation, they go, oh, yeah, that's right, I'm looking for the one with the pink top because that's what the advertising has taught me is actually what this brand, how I can easily find this brand in, say, a big clutter of bottled waters or some other category. Right. Right. So physical availability is like through advertisement, for example, uh, through our experience, we see it somewhere. And, and, and you talk also about CEP. So we need we need to first think about all the, of that brand and, and then we all, uh, that brand needs to be also easy, easy to find, for example, in a supermarket. Right. And I think it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a great moment to talk about just to give our listeners an example because not not of uh, uh, us may, may uh, actually know what we what we are talking about so for example i think tropicana is a great example right they rebranded they changed the packaging mm -hmm. and uh, as you just mentioned you walk into the store you look at the shelf and you want this with something with a pink top right so let's take tropicana as an example we are you we, we were used to this packaging with uh, this orange with a show uh right and then suddenly they changed that people couldn't find that they lost millions of, or i don't know uh, 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 of sales and uh can you just talk about that yeah i mean it's, it is a really good example it's it, you know, people sometimes find it a bit dated now but it is it what's fascinating is if you look online there's actually a wonderful ad age video that shows the people who, the agency that did the change for Tropicana talking about why they did it. And if you watch that video, there's a sense of familiarity in that you can imagine that happening anywhere because they did the changes with the best of intent. They didn't go, oh, let's work out how can we damage the brand. They genuinely thought they were doing the right thing and improving the design for the experience of the customer. But what they neglected was their cues that customers were using to find the brand. And when they took them away, they didn't do any form of re-education or didn't do that quick enough. And so what happened is they were no, they were invisible on shelf. And they're not the only ones. They're just the most high-profile ones because, yes, they lost, I think it was reported, about $20 million in sales in about a month. Um, that's not good um, when you're the leading brand. But I, I mean, I will say one of the things about being in the distinctive asset area is I'm, I'm somewhat of a confessional sometimes. And I have had people confess similar mistakes that maybe are less high profile that happen where people have 
change the packaging because of a, a good idea that just fails miserably in there because they didn't understand what you can change and what you can't. And actually, one of our researchers uh, will be has just finished a large-scale study looking at packaging change that will be coming out um, later this year um, that's really unpacking what happens behind the scenes with packaging changes because... As I said, they, it's not like people wake up and go, today I'm going to do something bad for my brand, but it's an unfortunate consequence that often that's what happens. Um, and so by better understanding what you can change and what you, if you understand what, what you need to stay the same, that then opens up the field for what you can actually change and gives more creative license because you don't have to worry about, am I doing damage to the brand? Because you're keeping firm the cues that you need, those shopping assets that people need. So separating out, and this is part of the other part of the um, what I want people to take away from the book and from our work in distinctive assets in general. It's only when you want something to be a branding device do you need to keep it the same. Because that's about building and refreshing that in memory. And once you narrow that down, once you've got those set of, say, four to six assets that you really want to hold on to, and that's really all you need when you, if you plan it right, that then leaves you all this freedom to change all the other stuff accordingly, to change right. the creative, to change the design, to change the, to change the messaging that you're putting out there. So it's about sort of quarantining off a few things that are these are the branding parts that we need to keep the same to give you the freedom to change all the other stuff. You no longer have to you know, be a prisoner to it. So part of it is liberating from a design perspective because you've, you've identified these are the things that are for memory purposes and to keep those memories fresh and, and being reinforced, we have to keep these the same. And you not only know what, what you're keeping the same, you understand why you're keeping the same. Because I think if sometimes if we're given constraints and not the reason why, they become shackles we want to throw off. Why can't I change the colour? It's not fair. I want to change. I'm a rebel. I want to change the colour. But if you understand the consequence of changing the colour is that you you miss that reinforcement moment, you potentially create your own mental competition and you hamper and damage the brand's long-term identity, then that makes you think twice about, well, do I really need to change the colour? Maybe I'll change something else instead. So understanding why I just think is really important because um, without that, um, we you know, we don't understand. We, it's hard to keep those policies in place if people don't understand why the policy is in place in the first place right and, and and your book is all about that right it's about all about why F finding finding out uh you know what we should change and then uh and, and then why we can change that right so just uh, my some of my takeaways um uh, regarding this first part uh, so there uh, just i wanted to set the stage for our listeners so so you need to first first uh, as you, as you say in the book you need to be in the race right so this is not for just like total startups that they don't have a logo or don't have any assets yet it, it yet is is more for you know brands who who are ready to rebrand right uh, well can i just say something there it's not so much it's not for them i do believe starters you mean to go on so if you're entering into a category, you do want to make sure, and you can do this by surveying the competitor landscape, so you are, have something that has the potential to be an ownable asset. So it won't be yet because people barely know your name, but there's no point in starting out with an identity that you then have to change later on when you become more well-known. So it is actually important when you start out to put the foundations in place. So you might not have a lot of other stuff in there, but you might make sure that your logo and your fonts and your colors are things that you know, do actually 
look like they could be ownable compared to the competitive space that you're in, even if you don't engage in active asset building until you've really built up the awareness that people know you're a member of the category. Right. So it's and not that it's irrelevant for them. It's just it's foundational rather than a focus of your strategy. Your strategy really should be letting people know you sell what you sell, first of all. Right, right. So, yeah, you you still so yes, you still you can use it, but you cannot just use it to to you know a, a, everything. You, you just cannot measure measure some of those things because you are not. Uh, you're just you're just a startup, right? So, but as you said, you you, you can you can, you can research your, your competitors. Com your competitors, right? Yeah, you can't. There's no point measuring yourself because, as I said, if your brand awareness is only say 10%, percent, yeah, then the maximum fame score, which is one of the key metrics metrics is 10 percent so there's no point in you know you're going to be low by by virtue of just not having the brand awareness exactly. but you can measure competitors and you can counter program to competitors and that's an important part in distinctive asset design counter programming to the environment and to competitors so you can start on the right foot, right? So yeah, and 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 I also have have some some uh, some of the examples of distinctive assets. So f think about just for our listeners, you know, Coca Cola bottle. Think think about that. It's very distinctive, right? You can find it in the dark. That's how it was designed. It's a very distinctive shape. A Red Bull cartoon style, for example, in advertisement. M and M's characters, right? Uh, HSBC the red border. Intel uh, uh, this famous famous sounds five note. Mnemonic. Monique. And Nike just do it, uh, the most famous tagline pr probably in the world, and 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 the Cadbury's uh, purple co color, for example. These are these are just so, so some of these examples, and there is m more of them in the book. But just just to give us something to think about while we are talking about all these things, so we can actually understand those concepts. So uh, you started talking about fame, and and fame is so this brings us closer to to the second section which is measurement, right? So you basically here you talk about two metrics, fame and uniqueness, right? And then you also give us this tool, a distinctive asset grid. Uh, so you develop this tool that allows us to, to, you know, to measure the strength of our brand assets. So can you just talk a bit about that, you know, how we can, how we can use this and what is fame, what is uniqueness? Can you just explain on that? Yeah, sure. So um, we did a lot of R&D into how to measure the strengths because one of the things we realized was holding back marketers when it came to making good decisions about distinctive assets was lack of measurement. And if you don't have any way to quantify measurement, you, you don't have any objective inputs into decision making. It's really then just opinion and, you know, all the loudest voice in the room wins. So um, we looked at different approaches. We looked at things like response latency in terms of the time taken to respond. We abandoned that quite quickly because it didn't give us the information that we needed, nor did it solve the problem that we wanted to solve, which is can the asset evoke the brand without the brand being present? Um, the nature of a response latency measure is the brand is present, but it's usually not the time taken to retrieve the brand that's a problem, whether it's, you know, 0.8 of a second or 1.2 seconds. It's actually is the brand retrieved or not. Um, so we then tested different ways of measuring things, whether you have the brand as a cue, whether you have the asset as the cue, whether you do it prompting for brands or not prompting for brands. And we found that the best approach was to um, – Prompt for the prompt, provide people with the asset and get them to elicit the brands unprompted. And the reason for that is that it replicates what we do in the real world. So when you see the shape of the Coca Cola bottle, your brain just thinks Coke. You don't ask it to, you know, it just pops into your head. Now, sometimes it doesn't, and for some people it doesn't, but for the vast majority, it does. Um, and then the second thing is about this form of measurement is it actually is a hard measure in that it's assets can draw strong on this, but it is quite hard to do it without prompting. When you prompt for brands, you make it easier for people to give you responses and you run the risk then of inflated responses. Things are higher than they really are in the real world. So you really can't prompt for brands at all. It will Get, make you feel like your brand identity is stronger than it is. 
So out of that approach of prompting for assets and um, getting people to elicit unprompted, there are two metrics you can extract. So fame is the first metric. We, well, uh, uniqueness is the first metric, so let's say now. Um, uniqueness is about the degree to which you are the only brand that is evoked when that asset is presented. And it can be audio, it can be visual, but you're the only a, brand. Can you give us an example? So for, for example, with the Coca-Cola bottle, right? If we see if we see the Coca-Cola bottle, most of the people will know it's Coca-Cola. Yeah, so, so if you saw the Coca-Cola bottle and say, um, out of the responses for the Coca-Cola bottle, 80% said Coca-Cola or Coke, some variety of it, and 20% said some other brand, maybe Pepsi or Dr. Pepper or Sprite, you know, something else, then their fame, their uniqueness would be 80% out of that. So what that would mean is the proportion of all the responses for their assets, um, what share does your brand get? So that reflects your own ability. The higher the uniqueness, so 100% would mean you're the only brand evoked when that asset is presented. Zero would mean you're not evoked at all and all the responses are for competitors. And the reason why uniqueness is the first metric we consider is because it's the hardest for you to change and control because it partially depends on what other people are doing. Um, because, you know, for better or for worse, distinctive assets are things we build. They don't just naturally occur. The other metric is fame, which is how widespread that knowledge of the link between your brand and that asset is. So in case of the Coca-Cola bottle, it might be that it's 90% fame. So nine in 10 category buyers when they see that asset, say Coca-Cola, and 10% might say a competitor or they might not say anybody. And people can say multiple as well. It's important to realise that people can have multiple brands attached to the same asset. It's a competitive memory. So you need to allow for that in your measurement. You can't assume it's just one brand, one asset. Although I will say in reality, most of it, we've done a lot of benchmarking on this. Most of the time it is one brand, but there are some assets like colours that are highly competitive spaces where you do get multiple brands linked to the same asset. So when we take those two metrics together, we can plot the strategic potential of it. And that's that's really what the grid is about. That's yep, that's the black and white version. There's a pretty colour version. And if anybody wants that, if they um, message me on LinkedIn or email me, I can send them a copy of that. Um, but um, yeah, what it does is it just allows you to see whether or not in broad senses the asset is usable as a replacement for the brand. Something that has a head start in terms of choosing um, a, a potential investment, something you should avoid because you're highly likely to evoke competitors or something that just has no real advantage at this stage. And all assets start down in the bottom, you know, 0% fame, 0% uniqueness. So being down there for a new asset is not a problem. That's normal. It's just you don't want to stay down there if you're trying to build the asset. You want it to move up over time. So this allows you to quantify it and well, see yes. how it tracks over time. So it's basically, well, you're basically you, team you, start, you start here and then depending on, on which quadrant you, you end up in, mm -hmm. uh, for example, you, you would want to end up in, in, in something like here, right? Use or lose. Yeah, so uh, that target point where the star is, is where you really want to be. 100% fame, 100% uniqueness. And it is possible to get up there. We do have assets that are very, very close to that. Um, you know, 95% fame, 99% uniqueness type of thing. Right. But the thing to, I mean, most of the time when we do, so we do this asset measurement for companies, and most of the time we do this, um, we're usually coming into an existing brand. And so what you find is you do a benchmarking phase where there's a whole range of assets all over the grid. And then you narrow that down to the ones that you're going to invest in the long term and the ones that you're going to invest in the short term, what your next year in terms of asset building looks like. Sometimes we test new assets to check to see there's no competitor encroachment already because people might have an idea for an asset, but you want to make sure you're not choosing something that's going to be really, really hard to build. Mm -hmm. Because if it's already got, you know, a competitor is already featuring in it, that's really hard to undo. And you run the risk if you promote that asset of actually um, 
promoting that more. Um, and so all of these things come into when you're doing that measurement benchmarking phase to set up your strategy going forward. Right. So it's all about effectiveness, basically. Uh, so so you allow us to you, you you present us with those tools and techniques and 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 and, to, and and tell us how to measure effectiveness of each brand asset so that we can be more effective in, in marketing in advertisement. We can make some meaningful decisions, right? So uh, you know, so we we can make some strategic yeah but we can make some efficient as well and efficient and effective, right? Some strategic de- uh, decisions. Uh, uh, so so we just uh, we. Not going to waste time developing assets assets that are, are not going to get us you know more sales or more growth or things like that it's, right it's, it's, yeah it's more about not wasting time on assets that you're not going to use a lot so for example if you don't do a lot of advertising in audio mediums you don't need an audio asset you can just say the brand name out loud in the few times that you are that can act as an audio asset you don't need to develop a special size sound or something like that but also um, if, if making sure that you don't duplicate your efforts so no one needs multiple taglines or multiple um, images and things like that so part of the philosophy behind the distinctive asset palette is to look at and to make sure that you've got diversity in the properties of the assets you build so that you can and this is part of the efficiency aspect of it, you're not uh, building, investing in building things that you've already got assets that already do that job. Okay, So you're actually smartly investing so that you are covering as many branding contexts as possible with the assets that are best suited to that environment. And that's where our R&D is continuing in looking at how assets operate in different environments and how do you improve your odds of getting the brand to stand out through asset selection and asset execution. Yes, and regarding asset selection, this is one of those, uh, this is how you categorize assets. Right. So, for example, we can have color assets, which can be a single color, color combination or design plus color. Uh, it can be word asset, which is, you know, like a tagline, as you mm-hmm. mentioned. It could be also words or fonts, uh, some distinctive, like, for example, MasterCard is is. Uh, priceless, right? We, we think about this. They mm-hmm. always talk about uh, th- this one word. So they actually own, they can own that word, right? And we have mm-hmm. also story assets, which is like star, style moments, human human face assets, which is really interesting. It's just like spokes uh, people, celebrities, and also characters like M and M's or Pringles, mm-hmm. uh, the guy from Pringles. Uh, music assets, as you mentioned, sometimes we 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 you know we may want to go there. Sometimes we we we. Don't don't uh, so it's like jingles like intel uh some popular songs we sometimes background uh, instrumentals and things like that shape sets uh which is like the you know the the of the packaging shape of the packaging mm-hmm. uh, logos and 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 symbols and other graphics and images yeah. and and sound assets like uh styles vocal and non-vocal so there is there are different types and you go into and you describe each and every type or, or it, it, all those uh, assets so you know, this is really interesting but uh, i just wanted to like uh show, show our listeners what they can expect what what are those actually what are those different assets right so so some of my takeaways from this part so we we've talked about uh, fame and uniqueness as two uh, metrics right so, so just to sum up, fame is how well the asset is known among, among category buyers and uniqueness is the brand's level of ownership of that asset. So if, if it's 100% that it triggers only one brand, you know, uh, if, if, it, if, if, for example, if the Coca-Cola bottle would be 100% uniqueness, then everybody knows that this is Coca-Cola and they don't mistake that for any other brand. Uh, uh, well, no, technically, if it's 100% uniqueness, it means anyone who knows a brand linked to that asset says it's Coca-Cola, but it doesn't mean everybody because everybody is the fame aspect of it. Uh-huh, okay. So uniqueness is only amongst those who do know the asset. So you can have 100% uniqueness with an asset that has only 10% fame. So only a right. few people know it, but the people who do only know, only know that mm-hmm. brand. 
Right. And that would so be first, something that was in investment potential quadrant that we would say, so now you've got the uniqueness, you just need to build that fame more and get more right. people know about it. So it's just the, the, just the difference between fame and uniqueness. Uniqueness is only amongst those who actually have a brand linked to it, whereas fame is amongst the whole population. Mm -hmm. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, okay, so that's about the, the second uh, section, and the, and the third section will be uh, implementation. So here we talk. Uh, so we basically answer the question: which assets we should build, right? We should what we should focus on. And he, so here, as I mentioned, you, you go over those different types of assets and and, and give us some further insights on and how to use them effectively. So perhaps we can just talk about a bit about you know the most important ones. Like uh, I think the Colors, uh, color would be like the the, the the major one. Shapes, faces, fonts, and sounds. Perhaps you can give us uh, some examples. Uh, just 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 to uh, clarify. So anything that hits our senses, whether it is visual, audio, smell, taste, or even touch, can be a brand asset, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can be. It's just that we tend to use visual and audio because that's what most of our media communicates. But, you know, if you're talking about a shopping asset where people are physically there on the shelf, then the touch, the feel of something can be, yeah, so that's possibility if you're in a retail setting, the smell of the location. So if you think of uh, brands like Lush or um, KFC or Subway with their bread, uh, use the smell so that you know, oh, there's a Subway down there because I can smell the bread baking. And taste. Taste is a tricky one because it usually can only kick in after you've bought it. So that's why it's not often used as a distinctive asset, but it could be. And, you know, who knows where technology will go in the future, whereby, you know, with um, virtual reality and haptics where people can feel things that we might have a wider sensory range of distinctive assets. But right now it's mainly our eyes and our ears. Um, and the grouping of the assets in the book is deliberate because that focuses on their common properties. So you talk about face assets. So most people talk about celebrities and spokespeople and characters like they're different. And they are, but they're also the same in that they all have a face and there's a power in a face because our sociological upbringing is such that whenever we go into a new scene and see a new scene, we will look for faces first. And we will always look for faces first because we want to know if someone is friend or foe and should we approach or should we run in the other direction as quickly as possible. And so, so faces have ability to command attention. And so all of those, whether it's a celebrity a spokesperson or a character has that power. That's the unifying thing from a branding perspective. It can bring attention to the brand because of the power of the face. But there are also drawbacks with that. And that's where, you know, I, I don't, you know, we've measured, uh, measured hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of brands, um, their distinctive asset strength. Most assets, well, all assets can be strong. And there's some research out there that suggests that there are some assets types that are better than others. I don't see evidence for that that in the main, I do see some asset types that are weaker than others, but in a lot of cases, it's an execution issue rather than an asset type issue. Um, so you know, we need to separate those things out. I've seen it's cases of all types of assets there have been really strong up near that target point on the grid. However, some types of assets that happens more commonly than others, mainly because of how they're chosen. And, and so if we look at face assets, celebrities are one where there's very few up in that top corner versus um, being highly competitive or not well known. And that's partly because celebrities bring their own mental competition to the table. Um, they have we have associations of celebrities and that interferes with our link between the celebrity and the brand um, and so when you choose a celebrity you get the attention getting and the familiarity but you also get the baggage that that brings in terms of retrieval and the ability to attach memories and this is where understanding how we build memories is really important for asset selection because then you might go well this celebrity isn't a great branding device they're really good to get attention to my ad and I can use them so people will know and my ad will cut through but I don't want to keep them as a branding device because they're actually really hard for me to get that get and keep that solid link with the brand because they have constantly got these other things going on that interfere with um, my brand being a prominent part of that person's network 
But having said that, there are some examples where celebrities do have strong links to brands. They're just very few and far between, and they tend to be celebrities that have had a long association with with one brand and don't advertise a lot of other brands. So, you know, and there are very few of those because most celebrities have multiple endorsements and um, that's part of the celebrity role. And so they often, they just have a lot of competitive clutter. So if we think about all of these different types as having properties that we can harness or should take into account when we're choosing, we can just make smarter choices. So colour, for example, is really good in environments where we can't see everything just by looking ahead at something. So, for example, if you're in a supermarket and you look down an aisle, you you have to move your head to see everything. You can't just see everything right in front of you. And when we move our head and we don't focus on anything, the only things our eyes can actually register is colour. So that's why colour blocks in supermarkets are particularly effective because we're looking around and we go, oh, yes, there's the bright yellow section. Oh, that's right, El Paso, which is a brand of Mexican food that uses bright yellow in its packaging. And so it allows us to see, oh, there's the chocolate. Yeah, I should get some chocolate because you've seen the purple wall of Cadbury. So all of these things help in that particular environment colour be a really useful asset. Right, but but it's selection, be tricky, right? Co- colour can be tricky. Be- colour can be tricky because first be- before we be- because there are also colours assigned to ca- assigned to category, right? Mm-hmm. Which yeah, we got one about. of our yeah, yeah. I mean one of our researchers has just done a big um, study on this as well. Um, so that will be coming out later this year too. And yeah, there's some interesting findings on that. I think mm-hmm. So um, the thing about colour is that it's easy to change. So it's a decision we always have to make because everything physical has to have a colour. And it's quite easy to change because you don't have to retool the factory. You just really have to, you know, press a different button for the die. Um, and so, and we did some work uh, previously um, looking at marketing spe- marketers' perceptions of changes um, to logos. Marketers were much more comfortable with changing the lo- colour of the logo rather than the shape of the logo. But when we tested the time to find the logo on a Facebook page, you know, like a Facebook ad, um, what we found is that the colour change was detrimental to finding the logo much more than the logo change was. So marketers were more comfortable changing a colour, but that had a worse effect than the logo, the shape change of the logo. So I think we just psychologically, so it's hard to keep a colour asset strong. It's hard to, well, it's hard to select a colour asset because there are so many things in your way. But even when you do, it's hard to keep it. And I've had heard anecdotes of, so Pedigree um, Dog Food is one of the brands that's very good at uh, the colour yellow permeating their packs, their advertising. And apparently even some creative agencies have gone, do we have to make another ad with yellow in it? It's like, yes, you do, because that's the brand's colour. So, you know, so so it's, it's, it's one of those challenges that it's a really powerful asset when you have it, but not many people have it. It's one of the biggest competitive playing fields. And some of them are competition that marketers create for themselves by poor decisions. I think Tiffany is, is is a good example, right? They own the mm-hmm. color in in this category. In, in yeah, you uh, never see a Tiffany's box in a different color, do you? They don't go, oh, for a special occasion for Mother's Day, we'll make pink boxes for a change. No, no. they own but how this many color. Times for Mother's Day, because we've oh no, we've got Mother's Day coming up here. How many brands change? for Mother's Day and all go into the swarm of the same type of style because isn't that what mum's like? Um, yeah. Yeah, so there are different assets and you describe all of them and at the end, so you start actually with seven scenes of, you know, of brand identity and you mm-hmm. end you end up with four commandments. So mm-hmm. four commandments would be choose wisely, resist change, execute well and prioritize smartly. Not going to go into details. So uh, you guys can check out the book. But basically, you, you also talk about this. Sometimes you have to advise companies to 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 do not change something, mm-hmm. you know, uh, because that's 
it's it, that can be costly for that can be a, a you know bad decision for them so you just prevent them from making this mistake so it's not always about knowing what to change and changing something but also you know sometimes not changing you know and 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 yeah. and, and knowing what what are your uh, strongest assets and and just stick to sticking yeah. to them some of my best um, research for clients has resulted in nothing happening and by that I mean they didn't make a big mistake by change or a costly costly change that would have no benefit to them. It's not even that it has to be a big mistake. It just has to be why are you bothering? There's no there's no benefit to doing this. And, you know, that's some of the best research I've done that no one will ever see the impact of because it's all about what didn't happen rather than what did happen. So as we are approaching the end of our interview, uh, please let us know how we can, uh, you know, f- find more about you, whether it is for uh, creatives like myself who want to learn more. Of course, I'm going to link to the book in the description box, but maybe for, for clients who want to work with you, how we can get in touch with you. Yeah, I mean, I, my email address is pretty easy to find um, being a university professor. Uh, if you just Google me, you can usually find me at University of South Australia or the Ehrenberg Bass Institute. LinkedIn is also a good forum. Um, I post a lot of things on LinkedIn. So, um, yeah, um, always happy to be um, connected with someone there as well. Thank you very much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it's that. Pleasure. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. So thanks for tuning in. And if you enjoyed this episode of On Branding Podcast and follow me on social media for more tips on branding, strategy and design. This was Arek Dvorniczak from Ivy Design. And I will see you in the next one.